Good afternoon. Uh, welcome. I hope everybody's got the uh, three major food groups, or actually the four food groups, uh, caffeine, glucose, alcohol, and code. Um, my name is Andy Katz. Uh, I'm a product manager at AWS, and I'm joined today by Tom Fallhaber, who's a principal engineer at AWS, and Jeremy Irwin, who is a solution architect with Cox Automotive. Um, we're going to talk to you today about machine learning workflows using Amazon SageMaker and AWS Step Functions. So let's start first with a quick poll. I want to know in the room of, of everybody that's here, who in this room is a data scientist or an ML scientist, somebody who's working on that side of the house? Hands up high. A small, a good number, but you know, an, an early, early crew. How many of you work with a data scientist or machine learning scientist? More people, okay. How many of you have tried using SageMaker? Okay, about half or third. How many of you have tried AWS Step Functions? Okay, the other half. All right. How many of you have no idea what I just talked about in any of those things? Okay, we got you covered too. Um, so today we're gonna to talk about four things. First, we're gonna talk about how you uh, can build, train, deploy machine learning models with Amazon SageMaker, a service that's really built for everyday data scientists and developers. Then we'll talk about building serverless workflows um, with less code to write and maintain using AWS step functions. Then Jeremy will talk a little bit about how Cox Automotive put these two together to improve collaboration between their data scientists and their software engineers. And then, last but not least, we're gonna talk about some new features that we're launching this week to make building these machine learning workflows even easier. So, we're gonna begin with SageMaker. And to talk about SageMaker, I'm gonna hand the floor over to Tom Fallhaber. Howdy, um, how many folks here saw Andy's keynote this morning? Okay, so a lot of you, and as, as you know, uh, Andy stole a little bit of my thunder by talking about what SageMaker is, but uh, um, I will recap and go a little bit deeper on uh, sort of what the more mainstream parts of SageMaker are. Uh, I think Andy talked about a lot of the, the, in addition to talking about the core of SageMaker, he also talked a lot about the sort of cool new stuff like reinforcement learning. Um, but I wanna sort of ground us in the sort of day-to-day -day parts of SageMaker. Um, so, uh, SageMaker is built, so, so first of all, big picture. SageMaker is a platform for doing machine learning. It is an agnostic platform in the sense that we don't think about which framework you want to use or which uh, software packages you want to use uh, or how you're building your model specifically. What we want to do is, is take away the undifferentiated heavy lifting that goes along with building machine learning systems. So uh, we build around three pillars uh, when we announced SageMaker a year ago. SageMaker has been out since reInvent last year, um, and it's been a very exciting year. Thank you for all of those of you who are using it, um, and please always be giving us feedback. But uh, when we built this last year, we had only these three services, um, and these have grown out over the intervening year to be much more complex um, and give you much more functionality. So first, users, Data scientists, developers who are interested in data science, people who are trying to build models, the first steps of what they're doing are gonna be exploratory. We're gonna talk in a little more detail about that later. Um, and the most common industry tool for doing that in machine learning now across platforms is the Jupyter Notebook and the Python kernels with it. Um, SageMaker includes, as its sort of entry point, um, a Jupyter Notebook service. You could go to the AWS console, open SageMaker, uh, click on Notebook Instance, and you have a Jupyter uh, Notebook server. You can customize that however you want. Um, so that's been uh, a very easy way to get on board. Um, it manages all the security of the notebooks. I, I, uh, anyone who's tried to deploy Jupyter Notebooks in, in any sort of production environment with security and so on knows it's pretty hard. We've done a lot of work to make that um, painless for you. Um, and then, SageMaker supports a lot of different kinds of algorithms, but there are three basic categories. We offer a family of highly optimized, highly scalable um, algorithms, including you know, so everything from sort of the, the granddaddy of clustering algorithms, k-means, at web scale, through at the other end of the spectrum, um, state-of-the-art, 
um, algorithms like Object of Vec, which we just announced last year, which generalizes uh, tools that have been built in languages to be uh, useful across a wider array, array of things. Deep AR, our forecasting algorithms, um, if you want to go a little bit deeper than what the, the um, forecasting service offers. So we have a, a bunch of different algorithms that are in there. Um, you can also write any algorithm you want yourself. You can package it and put it in SageMaker. That's a pretty easy thing to do. And then for the deep learning frameworks, we have a model where people can deploy uh, code into SageMaker with uh, what we call the 20 lines of Python. Everyone, anyone who's a real data, who actually practices data science here will know it's more than 20 lines of Python. But basically, how do I want my TensorFlow or my MXNet or my PyTorch neural net to work? You write that down and you submit it. Um, so once you've explored your data a little bit and organized your data in a notebook, um, you may find that a single instance notebook or the kind of thing you want to keep always running um, is not going to train very effectively. So we have a training service. The nice thing about the training service is you can submit your job. Um, the resources, it's, it's, it's a fully managed service, so you don't have to have any instances for it. The, uh, the service runs, creates the instances when it starts, shuts down the instances when it ends, you pay only for that window. It supports highly distributed training if your algorithms support it. The ones we build almost all do. Um, it supports GPUs and other great things, including our P3 instances. So one of the things we see a lot is people are trying to train very sophisticated models. Um, and as Andy talked about this morning, um, GPUs are expensive. So you don't want to, you know, the great advantage of having elastic compute cloud, right, is you don't want to be running things all the time when you're not using them. Um, SageMaker manages that for you. So I can run training on a P3, a big P3 instance, um, get my training done very quickly, pay only for the P3s from the time I start my training till the time I'm done. Um, on top of that, we have hyperparameter optimization. Um, those of you who've done any data science practice know that you know, algorithms are all well and good, but every algorithm has a bunch of knobs called hyperparameters, basically settings you put on it. Optimizing those is an art form. Uh, we have a Gaussian process hyperparameter optimizer. It's the same optimizer we use inside Amazon for training, our, for figuring out hyperparameters for itself, very state-of-the-art performance. Um, and what it does is it finds good, good settings for the hyperparameters um, very efficiently, and, and it has a bunch of controls for how you can cost control and so on. Um, then once you've trained a model and validated it, you, you like the model you have, you want to use the model, right? Now, there, there are two really common ways to use a model. Um, and I should stop here and mention that all of these parts of SageMaker are actually independent. So one of the things you can do is you can take the model from training and use it outside SageMaker. We have Greengrass support directly, so you can push it to Greengrass-enabled IoT devices, but you can also take it and use it for your own inference, say, within an application that you've built to do it or within a device that you're using and so on. Um, but, but now I'm going to talk about using the SageMaker features for doing um, inference, and we have two of them. Um, one is our real-time hosting platform. Um, this turns your model into an HTTP-based microservice protected by the standard uh, AWS SIGB4 authentication. Um, and so you can train a model and deploy it with a single line of code, and your developers can then call that endpoint as if it was any other microservice in your constellation, right? And what this means is developers don't have to write special code inside their apps in order to take advantage of machine learning models. So I'm writing a, uh, a cell phone app that maybe takes pictures of things and tries to figure out what they are or whatever. Um, I can send the image up, the image gets sent to the microservice, a categorization comes back from the trained model. The developer only wrote the, the call to the microservice. Um, so this is really great for deployment. Um, and then finally, we have uh, fully managed hosting at scale, or, or I'm sorry, we have batch transform, which can take giant, or not so giant, chunks of data um, in S3 and run inference across the whole set using massive parallelization. Um, so you, it, it's really great because one of the great things about doing inference is it's very scalable, right? Every record in inference is generally independent of every other. And so you can, for example, allocate 100 nodes to your batch transformation and get an answer very quickly. It costs the same as running a one node for 100 times as long, so why not, right? Um, so, uh, so that's pretty nice. 
Um, so we, a lot of people are building deployments. If you went to Andy's thing, he had a wall of people, which shocked even me. Um, that's pretty awesome. Um, and, uh, but I just uh, talk about three of them here. Um, Intuit was one of our launch partners last year. They've been uh, great users of SageMaker over the period of the year. What's interesting about Intuit is they have a very diverse set of use cases internally. They have places where they're training, they, they were already training models using Spark ML in their Spark clusters, and they're now using, um, SageMaker hosting to host those models. They have cases where they're uh, training TensorFlow models for internal use that they never deploy at all. They're just doing the training. And then they have cases where they're sort of using the whole thing together. Um, Grammarly is a, if you know what Grammarly is, they help you write. Um, and they're, of course, doing a lot of language work on top of SageMaker, and that's pretty cool. And then GE Healthcare is a great example of a company that's um, not using our inference, but rather um, training in SageMaker and deploying the resulting models into medical equipment, x-rays and so on, um, as part of ways to look for, uh, what I've been told is they're looking for cancer stuff. Um, so that's pretty cool. Maybe SageMaker will help save your life someday. That would be pretty great. Um, and so, uh, so, so there's a lot of, and you, and you saw that wall that Andy showed up. There's a lot of different things going on. Um, few of them are quite as cool as Formula One racing, but uh, um, they're all super useful to people. Um, so let's talk about the workflow of machine learning. Um, machine learning is this complicated cycle, and you can draw a bunch of different diagrams kind of like this, um, but this shows you sort of the layout. Um, <coughs> I'm not gonna dive into this in a ton of detail, but I wanna give you the, the feeling for how you go through here. Um, so first, you know, so the first set of things is mostly about data, okay? It's not really about machine learning. You'll hear this from every ML practitioner in the world is, you know, you hear things like data is 80% of the problem. Eh, it depends on the day, but you know, so, something like that is true. Um, so AWS, of course, has a ton of tools now for manipulating data. Um, and you can use all of those in conjunction with SageMaker. Um, you can use, uh, for example, we had a launch pad earlier today that was showing uh, using AWS Glue as a preprocessor for SageMaker um, transforming data. Um, you can uh, use all the tools that, that Amazon S3 gives you, including Athena queries, um, which lets you uh, reform data out of your S3 buckets directly. Um, and, uh, and of course, all our regular BI tools like Redshift. Um, and, and sometimes there are things you do in SageMaker too as part of this pre-processing step. Um, then the, the core of machine learning um, is this center block, and this is mostly what SageMaker is about as a service. Um, so it's where you're doing your training and your evaluations and thinking about what you wanna do. Now, there's this diamond on the bottom here that I'm gonna ignore for a minute because I don't wanna talk about it yet. Um, but uh, somehow you have to figure out if whatever you built you know, analyzing your data and, and training your model is any good, but if assuming you decide that that's okay, then uh, you need to deploy the model into some production setting, whether it's a batch setting or a real-time inference setting, um, and then you need to monitor that while it's running and make sure that the, one, one of the problems that models have is, is the world changes out from under them. Um, you know, your customer mix changes, uh, the camera is moved in a, in a in a vision application, you know, different things can happen um, that, that make the quality of the results change and you gotta keep track of that. Um, so these are all parts of this, right? But what you notice is there are all these lines going between them, right? And if I'm just creating a model from scratch, then what happens is I'm sitting there in the notebook and I'm kind of doing each of these steps one at a time. But once I begin to get into more of a production setting, I want some automation around that. Um, and this diamond is still a problem, no matter what. I have to figure out how I'm gonna decide if the model's good enough. Um, and so to talk about how we look at solving that and how we use step functions to solve that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Andy. Thank you. <clears throat> so it'll come as a, maybe no surprise, how do I deal with the lines between the steps? Well, one answer is AWS Step Functions. <clears throat> AWS Step Functions is a fully managed workflow service that lets you build resilient serverless workflows with less code to write and maintain and no servers to configure or manage. So the question is, for those of you that don't know Step Functions, how does it work? So we'll start with the same example Tom talked about, a photo sharing app. <clears throat> Say, suppose we're building this app and uh, we want to take a photo that we're going to upload to S3. So we'll start with the photo. Who wants to wave? Thank you. 
All right, so we have this photo. We send up S3. I've got an image of the crowd. And maybe I want to do a few things with this photograph. Like, for example, I might want to make a thumbnail of it so I have a smaller version of it. And maybe I also want to send it to Amazon Recognition and use the properties of Amazon Re Recognition to do things like, say, is Jeff Barr in the room? Let's find his face. Um, or count how many people are here. Um, or um, just tell me who's in, you know, who, who's in the room, where am I, what's the scene, what's the location. Um, and maybe I want to do these things at the same time. And when I'm done, write that information into a data store like, say, Dynamo. That's a basic workflow. In step functions, um, that workflow that we described is sitting here on the, on the left side. That's the workflow I described. That workflow on the right is that workflow implemented in step functions. And we implement workflows in step functions as finite state machines. And they have a variety of states. We have states that are tasks. We have states that are choices for branching logic. We have tasks that declare failure and throw an error code. Uh, we could do things in parallel, so we have a parallel state. And so that workflow I described, upload a photo when it, has, when it gets there in S3, start a workflow that makes a thumbnail, uh, sends it to recognition, writes the tags to Dynamo. That's the workflow on the, on, the, um, on the right side doing the same thing. Now, how do I actually write these things? Well, I write these things using something called Amazon States Language, which is really declarative JSON, and it's fairly straightforward. I can put in comments, so that comment is a keyword that will just say ignore this. Um, every workflow says, where do I start? So you say, start at this state. This state is called extract image metadata. That's the first state in the workflow. Now, if we take a look at that state, it's a certain type of state. In this case, it's a task. It's going to do work. And it says, where do I do the work? And that's where you give it the resource. In this case, the resource is a lambda function. You tell it which lambda function by giving it the lambda function's arn. And it goes to that lambda function and says, go do this work and call me back when you're done, and lambda will return the result. Um, and then when it's done, you say, what's next? And the next state says, go here. So these workflows are a lot of go-to statements with this next thing. But another nice thing you can do in step functions is have catch and retry logic. So if that lambda function has a problem, the image is too big, it throws an exception, um, you can catch that exception and go down different branches of your workflow with the catch statement in this task state. So you don't write the code, you just say, if lambda gives me back this message, go this direction. And if it's the kind of error where you just want to try again, you can retry. And you can set retries with linear and exponential backoffs for as many times as you think appropriate before failing the execution of the workflow. So you can build in a lot of resilience without writing a lot of code. Now, the heavy lifting in, in these workflows are done by the task states, and, and Step Functions has two types of task states. The first is called an activity task, and this is where the worker actually requests work from Step Functions. So when Step Functions gets to a task state that's a type of activity, it schedules the work and waits for an, a worker to call in and say, hey, do you have a job for me? And if Step Functions says, yes, I do, it sends it the payload from the state, and it sends it a task token that maps back to that specific execution of the state machine. Worker goes off and does work. When it's done, it sends the result back, and Step Functions maps that result back to the correct state machine. Now, while this is going on, you don't pay for Step Functions waiting for that activity worker. You only pay when you transition between states. And that activity task can be waiting for up to one year. So never pay for idle with Step Functions and activity task. And what can be an activity worker? any compute environment that can call the Step Functions API. So that means an EC2 instance, an ECS container, it could be a mobile phone if it has access on the internet. Um, all these things can call Step Functions and take work, do it, and return result. Now the other type of task is a Lambda task. And, and in this case, the behavior's a little bit different. When Step Functions transitions into a task state that is calling a Lambda function, Step Functions will synchronously call that Lambda function for you in your account, pass it the payload, Wait for the Lambda function to complete, and Lambda will return a result back to the state machine. It'll process that output and move on to the next step in the workflow. And as maybe you've heard, Lambda functions now run up to 15 minutes. And so this is a way to do tasks that take up to 15 minutes at a time. And you can compose workflows out of, out of both of these things. Now, I have a lot of customers that have built very big workloads uh, and this, you know, on step functions. Uh, some of the ones we talked about previously, uh, Yelp, Coca-Cola, and this week, Novartis. Uh, Yelp had a monolith that they wanted to make look like a microservice, and so they wrapped it in state machines and step functions. Their monolith took care of subscription billing for all their business, B2B customers, and it was one of these nested batch processes where if it broke, it was a stop-the-world event that would page the DevOps in the middle of the night. They'd have to get up, fix it, and get the thing restarted because the bill cycle had to get done on time. By wrapping in step functions, every bill for every customer suddenly became a microservice. And if it failed, they noted it, and they just kept going. And the net result was they had greater observability into this monolith, and it actually ran the jobs faster. 
Coca-Cola used step function to build a completely serverless nutrition syndication pipeline, which took data from um, clinical updates within Coke and dispatched it to all their partners. You can imagine all the bottling centers and all the restaurants and everywhere else, they distribute Coca-Cola products. This used to be a very manual, labor-intensive process then that took hours, and they turned it into something that took minutes. And they used the, the visual uh, diagram of the workflow to facilitate collaboration between the software engineers, and in this case, the clinical regulatory scientists, where they could very quickly have this common lingua franca to describe, is this the workflow we're looking for, yes or no, and get feedback, a very quick feedback loop to improve that workflow. And then finally, Novartis, which is you know, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, uh, uses step functions with AWS Batch, which lets you do batch processing, um, to process images that they get from their uh, drug discovery programs. So they take thousands and thousands of photographs and they use step functions to make sure that all the images go through image processing on batch and no image gets left behind because their, their experiments are designed to be statistically accurate by getting back all the data. And step functions ensures that all the data does come back. So that's step functions. So we'll get back to our story. Now we've got SageMaker and step functions, peanut butter and chocolate. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about how we put these things together. <coughs> so. Let's go back to that machine learning cycle. And Tom mentioned, you know, there's a step here that he glossed over, which is, I've made a model. And there's a question is, is this model any good? That can't always be decided by an algorithm. Sometimes it has to be decided by a human. And so how do you deal with a human in the loop of one of these workflows? Well, it turns out you can actually do this workflow with step functions as well. And to give you an idea of how that's done, I'd like to give the stage over to Jeremy Irwin. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. Uh, for those of you that may not have heard of Cox Automotive, we're obviously operating in the automotive vertical. Um, our clients range from consumers to OEMs, and we're generally building products that, uh, that suit their interests. So some of the products that you may have come across are things like kellybluebook.com if you're doing automotive research. Uh, here in the U.S. or in select countries, or you may have used one of our uh, one of our products to schedule an automotive service appointment uh, when you had to take your car in for for some service. And I'm going to share uh, a model review pipeline that we build using AWS Step Functions uh, to solve this issue of a human needing to review the model before it went to production. So we'll start with a, a quote from one of our. Uh, decision scientists, and I'm going to use the, cer the term decision scientist uh, synonymously with data scientist. That's just how we brand it at, at Cox Automotive. And Jeff's concern was that the underlying data that the model is being retrained on is going to change over time. And because we're kind of one step removed from that model be or from that data being um, updated, we don't always see changes in the patterns, and that could lead to um, either uh, bias being introduced to the prediction model, or unintended consequences that we didn't uh, set out to, to, to uh, do in the first place. So the, the context of the business context was that our decision science and engineering teams were asked to uh, create a prediction model that was going to be put into uh, an advertising recommendation tool. And the, uh, for, for those of you that may not be familiar with advertising, it's, it's a little bit like, it's a little bit like uh, your retirement portfolio. So instead of determining stocks and bonds and mutual funds and then weighing the relative risk and return, we're trying to help our clients make decisions on where they're spending their advertising dollars. Should they be spending it in search advertising, in video advertising, in search uh, or social advertising? And we're trying to give them the greatest uh, gain in terms of website visits, form submissions, phone calls to their, uh, to their dealership. Uh, and so what the, what the plan was that, was that our engineering team already has an application that is creating recommendations. We're going to put a prediction model into that application. So engineering was going to take care of the back end services, the front end services, the UI. And our decision sciences team was going to create the, uh, the algorithm that would drive, uh, uh, drive the UI, or part of the UI. But we weren't really sure how to integrate each other's work, because we're going to essentially build an algorithm, throw it over the fence to uh, engineering, who is then going to, to put that algorithm into production. 
So our engineering team was concerned with how are you delivering the model? How often is it being delivered? How do I monitor whether the delivery was successful? And our decision science team was more concerned about how can I not get involved in the deployment? I'm going to give you a retrained model, and I don't want to be involved. Um, because we work on different cadences, our engineering team is on two-week sprints, our decision science team is more on, on waterfall-based projects, so those schedules generally don't, don't align very well. So our approach to work is, is pretty varied, even though we're working on the same thing. Our goal is that we're putting ML into a product. However, the roles on the teams are different, the uh, tools that we use are different, the languages that we use are different, the development processes that we use are different. Uh, our decision science team wants to, or is focused on model precision and accuracy. Our engineering team wants performance. We, if we're gonna put this into a UI, we need sub-second performance. We don't want the model uh, um, taking a, a couple of seconds to return us a, a, a value. We also wanted to support our decision science team using R, because that's what is most natural to them. Our engineering team tends to use Java. And we want to make collaboration between those teams as easy as possible so that we wouldn't have to think about uh, doing the work every time a model was retrained and needed to go to production. So thanks to Ali, this was kind of our starting point, was this um, AWS blog. Um, it provides very basic example, but the, the value is that you're running this process that can, as Andy said, take up to a year um, before the, the state machine will fail. And that allowed us to get this human in the loop feedback before models promoted to production. So here's what our uh, model deployment pipeline looks like. So if you imagine the slide that Andy was just talking to where the data scientist makes a uh, dec decision, this is like that part of the process and we're zoomed in. Um, the VPC on the left represents a decision science account. The VPC on the right represents an engineering account. And our model artifacts are being delivered in a zip format, and the model itself is being delivered as a tarball. Uh, and so the way that this works is that when a model is retrained, it's dropped into an S3 bucket. That S3 bucket invokes a lambda, which starts the execution of a state machine. And that state machine is then going to, um, going to wait because the, there's an external worker that you can see in, in orange that's checking in with a state machine every five minutes to see if there's a new model available. And that five minutes is configurable. That's just what, what um, we have set in our pipeline. So there's a CloudWatch uh, scheduled Lambda that is invoked every five minutes. It checks in if new models are available. If new models are available, what that Lambda is going to do is construct an email, send an email through SES. And uh, SES is simple email service, if you're not familiar with it, and it's just uh, Amazon's uh, service for sending and receiving email. That goes to uh, uh, an alias for our data scientists, notifying them that a new model is available. Please review the diagnostics and then determine whether this thing should go to production or whether to reject it and it won't go to production. Um, so someone takes their time to, to review that, then they eventually click one of the links in the email that fires off a request to API Gateway, which then invokes a Lambda, which is going to prepare arguments to get back to the, the state machine to let the state machine know which way it should go, approve or reject. Um, and that's, that's what you see in, in, in the blue loop. If the model is approved, then what you see with the pink lines on the, on the diagram happens. So the state machine invokes another Lambda, and that Lambda, all it's doing is, is copying from one S3 bucket to another. So let's, look, uh, let's take a look at the details of the step function itself, because that's where kind of uh, all of this is centered around. So the, the visualization at the left-hand side of the screen, uh, like what Andy said, this is, this is available in the uh, AWS console, and it's kind of a nice visualization of what your state machine looks like. So I'll just talk through each of the states real quick so that you get an understanding of, of what each one is doing. So, so get new model is responsible for getting model metadata, mainly the S3 prefix and the, uh, and the file name. Uh, get manual review is the state that's responsible for uh, both 
creating the email, sending it out to the team, as well as receiving the response back from our uh, decision scientists. And uh, then it moves on to approve or reject new model, which is a choice state. And it's going to say, OK, based on that data scientist input, which one of these paths do I go down? Approve new model, the approve new model state is simply that state that copies the, the model from our decision science account to our engineering account. And success state and uh, reject new model states are simply uh, pass and fail states so that the model um, will, will finish cleanly. And then let's take a look at the code snippet on, on the right. Uh, so you can see get new model, that's where it's starting. And the, the get new model has a resource of a lambda. And the git manual review has a resource of an activity. And so I want to talk a little bit more about um, that, that activity as a resource, because that's what's helping us get the human in the loop in, in our process. Um, I'll mention result path here. Um, the first one, it's denoted by dollar sign. That just basically means, hey, state, whatever you get as input, send it through as output. And in the second example, the git manual review, there's dollar sign dot task result. It's saying, get what you have as input, take whatever the worker output, append those two things together, and send that through as the state's output. Um, show of hands, anyone have applications that have timeouts of, of one week? OK, I'm the only one. Um, so so it, there's, there's, other, there's other parameters that you can configure in the state, but we've set our timeout to be a week, so we expect our decision scientists to reply to the email in, or, or click a link in the email within a week. So now let's, uh, let's move on to a couple of, th a couple of the important features that I, uh, that I want to share with you that uh, were kind of essential in building this. One is the activity token, and then the other one is the state input and output. All right, so Andy already described uh, the process that I have in pink on the slide, what I'm calling the call work respond pattern. This is where the external worker is just uh, calling the activity, it gets a token, it does its work, then returns a response. And for our pipeline, we had this process that starts in pink but then ends in orange, and what I'm calling the call work delegate respond pattern. So first part happens, but then that token that you get from the state is, is essentially delegated to uh, any number of downstream services that you want it to be delegated to or, or downstream workers. And eventually someone needs to pass that task token or something needs to pass that ta task token back to the state so the state can update itself. And this is what's allowing us to have this kind of out of band process happen um, w within our pipeline. So let's take a look at what this, what this looks like. On the left, I'll, I'll be highlighting the portion of the, uh, of the process that corresponds to the code snippets on, on the right. So let's pretend that a new model is available. CloudWatch scheduled Lambda says, hey, there's a new model. It's going to get the model, uh, model diagnostics file, and it's going to uh, parse the, uh, or get the task token from the state machine. And all we're doing here simply is, is calling this get activity task function, which returns task token. Uh, we're parsing that out and then URL encoding it, because we're going to use that task token as a path parameter on the end of the, of the URL. Uh, so uh, uh, once, once we build that, we send this thing through, uh, through SES to generate an email. So what does the data scientist actually see? Here's the email that they see, um, and this is generated through SES. This isn't pretty. It's not uh, uh, client-facing or customer-facing, and so it's just uh, a, a, raw, um, a raw email. There's model diagnostics attached to the email, and that's serving two purposes. One uh, is our decision scientist doesn't have to go, go fetch the, uh, the model diagnostics, and that's also eliminating errors from happening because they could grab the uh, diagnostics for the wrong model and then click, that, click the button incorrectly and make a wrong decision and move something to production that we don't intend to move to produ production. 
And then those big long uh, links that you see at the bottom are simply approve and reject links. It's the URL for API Gateway with a path of approve or reject and then that um, then really long task token string on the end of it. Um, so we'll move to the part of the process and before we, we um, go there, I just wanna share how we configured API Gateway. So API Gateway has a single endpoint. There's two paths, approve and reject, and this is, um, this is what it, it's expecting. It's expecting a task token. This is defined in the serverless framework, so if you're using AWS native tools, um, this is gonna look a little bit different than what I have on, on the screen, but uh, we're using serverless to deploy um, our lambdas and, and uh, lambda-associated um, AWS services. So now that we see that how that's defined, I want to uh, kind of complete the loop. So in orange, we're simply just parsing uh, the task token from the, uh, from the string that goes through API Gateway. And we're adding task success output and task failure output because that's going to drive uh, for a subsequent state machine behavior. And then we're preparing arguments, um, the task token and, uh, um, and the output in this slide. And then this is part of the same process. We're using the state machine function called send task success to pass that through to AWS step functions. Um, one thing that I wanna call out that I think that's important, uh, and I made the mistake when I first went through it is, if you, if you use the function called send task failure, that um, fails the state immediately, and your state machine doesn't finish cleanly. So to prevent failure ambiguity, we're using send task success, so that even if the model is rejected by the, the data scientist, that our state machine is still gonna finish cleanly, and we won't have to worry about um, a state machine that is half finished as having uh, maybe being a rejected model or maybe having some sort of other, other error. So now that I've kind of shared how we're passing around the token to, uh, to enable this uh, human in the loop process, I wanna take a, a, just a few moments to talk about state input and output. So lambdas are intrinsically stateless and we're using uh, state machines to help capture so, some history, some state from previous lambdas. And so where this comes into in our, uh, in our pipeline is that our first state gets metadata about the new model. Our fourth state, I think fourth state, requires, it needs to know where the model is because if the model is approved, it needs to go fetch it. So we don't have to make subsequent calls to S3 and try to figure out what the model was that started the execution of the state machine. We just pass that data all the way through the workflow so that the downstream state that requires it has it available. Um, and if we need to know information about the history of how a, a Lambda executed, we can also pass that through as, as out, uh, output. So uh, this is what it looks like uh, uh, as output from the state machine. So get new model get, has diagnostics file path and diagnostics file name, and it has that as its output. Because it has uh, that data as its output, get, that's the input to git manual review. And git manual review, as I mentioned, is this state that is responsible for both sending the email and getting the reply from the data scientist. So when that reply comes in, we append the task result uh, with, with his or her decision and then keep flowing through the, uh, through the state machine. And this approve or reject new model state is basically a choice state and it's looking for an object called task result and parameter called decision, and then just doing a string comparison to determine whether it's approved or, uh, approved or rejected. So here's what we changed about the AWS blog. It, it, was, it was very simple. There was a single state state machine. It was created with the AWS console, which obviously was not gonna work for us to stamp these things out in, in production and it didn't leverage uh, state input and output at all. We also had to change some other things um, with SES and uh, our infrastructure as code scripts, um, but I won't get into the details of those. So our, uh, walking away from this, this pipeline allows us to collaborate a little bit easier and reduce 
wait states and frustration between the teams. As I said, the teams are on different cadences, and because it's all automated in, uh, in AWS, the data science uh, folks can do their work, and when a model is approved for, uh, for production, approve it, and then it just goes and sits in an engineering bucket until engineering is ready to deploy it to production. Um, so that's, that's helped kind of the integration between both teams. Thank you. That's really interesting. I'm curious, um, in this experience, what did you learn from each other? What did the data scientists learn from the engineers in this experience? Our, our data scientists learned how to share. Um, <laughs> no offense to any data scientists. Uh, they're, they're just, they just weren't following the same patterns that, that we use in, in engineering. So uh, the, if they were working on a project and working on a model, they would create their own infrastructure and services for that specific project. And there wasn't this concept of building something like a pipeline that can be used across the team, across all projects. We um, help them uh, use Terraform in a way where they can share Terraform scripts uh, and, and, and not overwrite one another and not worry about stepping on one another. And then lastly, they're operating one AWS account, and we're generally operating in at least two non-prod and prod. And so we've also introduced that concept by parameterizing our code. They should be able to run it in, in, in either environment. OK. That's, it's only fair, I ask, so what did engineering learn from the data scientists? So, so uh, the engineers, I think, we, we learned how models can go, quote unquote, off the rails. Like when the underlying data changes, uh, sometimes you, you just won't realize it until it's too late and we don't want our clients to see mistakes. Uh, the, the second thing is that in engineering, we can generally like, make anything work, and kind of, even if it's cobbled and hacked together. And uh, sometimes in our decision scientist folks just can't make something, they can't make a model work if we don't have the right data. <laughs> um, and then lastly, I think, and maybe the most important thing is when we're building systems, we're often thinking about the data that we need for the transaction and what we're going to need if we ever need to go back to that data and what tertiary systems might need. But we're not always thinking about if we need to build a model on top of this, do we have the right data and are we storing <coughs> that data in the right format that's going to enable our data scientists to do their job. That's really interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks. So that's part three. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, part four is, well, so what's new? <coughs> so let's come back to uh, building, training, and deploying models um, in a Jupyter Notebook. So if you think about it, this looks a little bit like a workflow. We retrieve the data. Uh, you click through. You say, train my model. When model training is done, you say, OK, now go transform this batch of data. Um, and when you build a single model, you can step through these things and iterate as you need. But essentially, this is a workflow being manually run by a human. But you can automate the same workflow with step functions. And when you do that, it looks something like this. So you have a state machine that retrieves data. When the data is retrieved, it trains the model. You wait for the training to complete. When the training is complete, if it succeeds, you go on to uh, create a model and transform that data. If that succeeds, you can exit and say, all is good. And you can see this bottom row, you can go to different states of success or failure. So by inspection, you can look at that workflow execution and say, did it work or not? Now, this works well. but Customers like you said, hey, can you make this easier? And so we did. Uh, today, we're introducing the ability to run asynchronous jobs in Glue and SageMaker without writing code. What that means is from a single state, you can start a job, and that state will wait for that job to complete before moving on to the next step. So that workflow we looked at before goes from what you see on the left to something much simpler, much cleaner, more direct on the right with less time to put it together. Um, now, how does this work? Well, step functions you write in state's language, so what's different? Well, so first thing we've introduced is, you remember task states have a resource. That resource is an ARN. We're introducing this thing that Tim Bray likes to call a magic ARN. Um, in this case, it's the magic ARN for glue. So it has a uh, endpoint states, that's step functions. The service we're going to call glue, and the API we're going to call, which is start job run. That's the API call to start a job run in glue. Glue is an ETL job service for people who don't know. It's a fully managed serverless Spark. That dot sync extension at the end tells step functions, hey, wait until this job is done. So it turns the asynchronous job into a synchronous job. Now, how do you configure the glue job? We have this block of parameters, which tells glue 
this is how I want you to run the job. How many DPUs do I want? A big job, a small job? Uh, do I want any parameter overrides, et cetera? But it's a task state, which means that you can still catch errors and you can still retry if something goes wrong with that job. So just like Lambda tasks or activity tasks, you can build try-catch patterns into it. Now for SageMaker, we have two. Uh, one is the training job, one is the transform job. And you can see the same set of magic arns. One is for create training job, one is for create transform job. And now you see SageMaker is in the middle of that magic arn. But another important thing to notice is in these parameter blocks, I have two ways of describing them. So one is I can make them strings. So every execution will give the same parameter SageMaker. So something like maybe the algorithm that I want to use, I specify the container and it's the same every time. But maybe I'm playing around with parameters, I can change those. So if you look at um, the create transform job, the name of the transform job, when I put a suffix, that dot dollar sign, tell step functions, hey, what comes next is actually JSON path. And that JSON path comes from the input to that task state, find it there which means that every execution of that workflow, you can give it a different transform job name, and it will substitute that name before calling SageMaker's API. And in this way, you can run many, many workflows concurrently in parallel, and this is a way to scale up your, your job from that single notebook that you're stepping to to many, many things running in parallel. And so this is designed to make life easier. Now, there's more that we're working on to make life even easier for those of you especially, how many folks of the data scientists and also the software engineers uh, work in Python? Okay, so Tom has a surprise for you. <laughs> so this is actually pretty cool. We can now use, uh, use JSON to define a, a workflow very cleanly and statically. We can then use the visualizations tool and step functions to look at that workflow, and we can see the visualizations that uh, Jeremy was showing us earlier, and, that, and that's nice. Um, one thing that's missing from this is the ability to attach the lambdas directly when you're using lambdas. Uh, we tend to use CloudFormation to combine these things um, so that we'll define a lambda and then define a, uh, uh, we'll define a set of lambdas in our, in our CloudFormation template and then define the um, state machine that uses it. Um, so that works great. But then a lot of times what we find is we want to be able to create very flexible state machines, right? We don't want necessarily static state machines. We don't want to be redefining the, um, the JSON every time. Um, and to help with that, um, we can use the AWS Cloud Developer Kit. Um, you might have seen the announcements about this um, or might not have. Um, this is a tool that lets you build in code um, all cloud resources. Um, so you can define it. It uses CloudFormation underneath to deploy the resources, um, and it supports step functions. It's a multi-language tool. Um, currently, it's supported in JavaScript, TypeScript, Java, and C Sharp. Um, and uh, of course, the languages of data science are Python and R. Um, Python is coming. I'm going to show you some example code right here. Um, so. Uh, Instead of writing JSON, I can write, uh, here we have, uh, um, first on the upper left, we have defining a, the transfer step. This was the downloading step that we defined. That's a lambda. Um, this is only part of the code that would define this. Um, then below that, uh, we see the uh, task for doing the SageMaker connector um, to do the training. Um, in this actual step function, there are a bunch more states that do uh, transforms and stuff. But then you can see in the top right, um, now we define the sequence that those steps run in. And it's as simple as just saying next, next, next. Here, if you have choices, um, you'll have branches and you'll end up getting multiple things and you'll, you'll attach to each one. Um, you can fail the state machine and, and do all the different things here that happen. But it's, it's a very simple way to construct. Now what's nice, and then at the bottom we actually create the CDK version of a, a state machine um, that can then be deployed with cloud formation and you can run that state machine. So you can create new state machines for every job very simply. You can, the neat thing about working in Python is we can now create functions or classes that encapsulate part of what we want to do and parameterize it the way we want to parameterize it. So I can have, um, for example, subgraphs of the state machine that may be not identical 
um, that run. I can define parallel jobs very easily in code where I have, you know, I may not know a priori how many things I want to run in parallel, but I can construct the state machine that does, that sets up that parallel based on the data that it gets. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and that's coming, that's, uh, um, we'll have a link to, to where that is at, at the end, um, but you can use it today uh, in the languages I, I talked about, and very soon you'll be able to use it in Python. So I hope you enjoy that. Back to you, Andy. Thank you. So tying thing together, really what we're trying to do here with the new features and with SageMaker and Step Functions paired together is really let you spend more time on the code that differentiates your business and deliver faster. Now, some companion sessions related breakouts, um, some you'll have to find online, some are still available um, today and tomorrow. Um, things around uh, serverless state management with uh, the serverless platform, uh, building event-driven architectures, and, uh, and sessions on SageMaker. Uh, for more on, uh, st for, on SageMaker, uh, visit Amazon.com machine learning. For more on step functions, you can visit Modern Apps, which has step functions as well as Lambda and, and other serverless um, services. And to learn more about the CDK, it's developing an open source. It's in uh, developer preview right now, and you can find that on GitHub at AWS Labs, AWS-CDK. So with that, we'll say thank you. Um, we'll ask you to please complete the survey in the mobile app. Um, nice things, please. And uh, we'll be at the side to answer questions uh, for anybody who wants to stick around and follow up on anything of interest.